Best Available Podcast, Episode 9. I am Ryan Wallace, joined this time by Matt DeLuca, the same guy that's been on the, the past eight podcasts. It is October 5th. Just like to remind all of you to go over to bestavailableplayer.com. We got a lot of awesome content over there. Sophia and Caroline for their newest episode of Forward Progress actually got to interview a Swiss professional golfer named Christina Glor. That was a really insightful interview. They talked about a lot of neat stuff. So go check that out. You can even check it out before you listen to this. It's a very quick listen. I think it's only about 20 minutes or so. So go listen to that. You won't be disappointed. But Matt, it's October which is kind of weird to say there are not many weeks left in the year 2020. This year has it's simultaneously flown by and at least for me gone by very slowly at the same time, but we're, we're almost there. We're kind of in a good part of the year. I'd say I I've been on the record of saying October is the best month of the year. Just that's when a lot of the fun sports are going on and, I know it's a little different this year with what's been going on, but still we have the NFL, got college football, we got playoff baseball. Normally hockey would be starting up right around now too, but, you know, unfortunately we're going to have to wait a couple more months for that. But Matt, this is the the weather, at least for me, has been nice. I've really enjoyed it. Gotten outside, done some walking, done some nature trails, done some other stuff, nice little bike rides. This is the best time of the year, I think. Uh, 2020 can't end soon enough, Ryan. You say there's not a lot of weeks left. Uh, thank, thank everything that that's the case. Uh, what a week we've had uh, since we last talked on the podcast. Lots of newsworthy stuff. Big uh, Shams Tarania tweet around 1 a.m. Uh, on Friday. So Shams got a nice scoop there. Um, big week in sports the weather ryan is nice i haven't really been outside a lot uh recently i uh, sustained a minor injury playing basketball in september uh that has refused to heal so we're now uh, waiting a little muscle strain uh so we're trying not to, to aggravate that anymore but you know it's good i'm sure all of our friends that are listening are going to call me soft but that's fine but Fun week. I'm not as big of a college football guy as as the the next person, but uh, you know, must suck to be an Oklahoma Sooner fan, Ryan. Oof, back to back tough losses. Yeah, yeah, you know, especially going into the year trying to think. I was gonna say, man, especially if like you combine being a Sooner fan with like, I don't know, I'll just pull some teams out of, out of a hat here, like the Cowboys maybe, or even like the St. Louis Cardinals. If you're a fan of all three of those teams, it's been a it's been a rough go for you. Yeah, literally in simultaneous days from Friday to Saturday to Sunday. Um, I think the Cardinals lost Thursday. No, they lost Friday. Still, rough, rough weekend for if those are, those people were out there. Um, but yeah, Alabama's back. That's all I know about college football. College basketball, Ryan, is going to start up in about seven weeks. So going to have a nice little preview for that up on the site soon so yeah fall i know you're a big fall guy though and you play fall guys i did until my my playstation 4 entertainment console broke sony so i can no longer interesting timing interesting timing of the break ps5 comes out in a month i think actually like four maybe five weeks i think it comes out on november 12th so yeah i guess five were you one of the were you one of the six people that were able to successfully pre-order the console? Matt, I've been trying. I've been looking every single day. It's it's very difficult. I don't think I'm going to get one when it drops at this rate. I think I'm going to have to wait, which is fine. Yeah, you know, it's, I understand. Hopefully, I'm able to get it before the end of the year, and I don't have to wait until 2021. But we'll see. Uh, it's you know, it's just the way of the road is is what I like to say. We had a uh, jam-packed week four in the national football league so we're going to start off with that a lot of a lot of entertaining games i will say that uh you take a look here down the schedule of course we'll do the same thing we've been doing where we give uh, a little more time to certain games joe burrow got his first win they played the jacksonville jaguars 33 to 25 the Bengals team you could make the case could be three and one right now but they'll take one two and one get to get a win in there 
the Seahawks took bit, took care of business against Miami. They won 31 to 23. Um, Baltimore did what they need to do. They were a big favorite going into the game and they defeated Washington 31 to 17 on the back of a 21 to 10 halftime lead. Arizona dropped to two and two. So they were kind of a, a preseason playoff darling. And I myself was very high on them. I said that they could win that division. And after two strong weeks, they've kind of sputtered a little bit. They have not looked very good on either side of the ball, in my opinion. But I'd say the biggest one o'clock game, and Matt, this is actually kind of easier for us because one of these games got moved to week seven. Another game got moved to tonight. So that's two less games we have to talk about. But the, the I'd say the one of the most entertaining games of the one o'clock slot was a shootout in Dallas. It was Cleveland and Dallas and the Browns, they might be for real, Matt. They're three and one. They won 49 to 38. Dallas once again tried to pull something out of their behinds in the fourth quarter. They put up 24 fourth quarter points, but it was not enough. Odell Beckham Jr., three touchdowns, which is it might be his best performance as a Cleveland Brown since he was traded there. I don't know, Matt. It's I want to start with Cleveland because they won the game. You've been saying this for a while when it comes to the Browns, when it comes to most teams that are like the Browns, and I've kind of adopted the same mindset. You could talk about how much hype that they have, this and that, how much talent they have, but they kind of have to prove it to you before you buy in. And I'm starting to buy in personally to this Browns team. Three and one, their offense looks very good. I know that they, they lost Nick Chubb. I don't know for how long. I think they still have to perform an MRI to get a, an actual picture of how long he's going to be out. But still, Baker is has looked improved. The running attack looks to, I'd say, arguably be, you know, I'll say they're one of the best in the NFL. I won't say they're the best, but, it, you know, even without Nick Chubb, they just throw other guys in there and they look just as good. Didn't seem like they missed a beat. The defense, it did look good until the fourth quarter. I don't know if that's because they let up a little bit and they're playing prevent. I don't know if that's just because Dallas finally figured out what they were doing wrong. But, Matt, I think this Cleveland team, they're 3-1 and one right now, and especially with that added postseason spot where seven teams make it, you take a look at the Browns' schedule. I think it's very possible that we're talking about this team making the playoffs for the first time in a long time, just based on their strong start. Yeah. So I think with, with teams like Cleveland, uh, you're right. They I have a big show me attitude when it comes to, to overhype teams. Uh, Tampa Bay is in the same boat. If we're, if we're talking just NFL teams, Cleveland, uh, the one thing I'll say, Ryan, and I've said this about the Patriots for a number of years because of the division they play in good teams beat the teams they're supposed to beat. And to Cleveland's credit, right? So week two, you beat the Bengals team. You should beat with the team with the roster that they have. Uh, you play it was football team last week, right? And you beat the football team. Uh, and then this week you play Dallas, right? And it's not like they should have won this game, but Dallas hasn't really proved anything to anyone this year. So you get those two wins under your belt, and now you go up against a team to where you could kind of put yourself on the map. And I th and I think they did. 38 points when you allow that, Ryan, and 24 in the fourth quarter. Obviously, you have a little bit of an advantage, uh, and I'm going to preface that you were able to watch a lot of these games. Uh, I've had to play catch-up um, because I got home around 6 o'clock uh, from work. But I will say, following along on Twitter, Ryan, uh, Cowboys fans were not too happy with their team's performance. Uh, I don't know what it is about this team to why they can't really put things into gear until the fourth quarter. I know we're going to talk about them uh, later on, but for Cleveland, Ryan, I think the best case scenario for them is what's happening right now to where you have this great backfield that takes the pressure off of Baker Mayfield to where he can make the throws he needs to. And I think that's the best thing for him. And we, we I think a lot of people forget uh, that Baker Mayfield still kind of young to the NFL, not too many years under his belt. And the fact that there's all this immense pressure on him being the number one pick, uh, this backfield really helps him out. Uh, then this guy, Dearness Johnson, who I'd never heard of until yesterday, came in and had 95 yards on the ground. Uh, so it's, it's a deep backfield that should help them out. Uh, Odell Beckham, 
Sorry, Giants fans, maybe cover your ears right now. Had a really good day, uh, two touchdowns. So I agree with you, Ryan. They're showing me, and I will admit it. Uh, I, I've It's not that I've been a Cleveland critic. I've just – I've been with- – waiting for them to kind of put themselves on the map. So, yeah, I, I think they're in a really good spot. And on the road in one of the few places that has fans, if we're talking still about, you know, home field advantage uh, to go into Jerry World and win, you got to give them props there. It's a, really, it's a really good step for Stefanski, and it proves that his stuff, unlike most of the guys that came before him in that coaching role, is working. So uh, it's exciting time for Cleveland fans, to say the least. The AFC North has suddenly turned into a very competitive division. The Steelers, of course, they were not able to play this week, but they are 3-0. and Cleveland and Baltimore both find themselves at 3-1. and And Cincinnati, who, as I said, you could make the case that they could be 3-1 and right now, too. They lose the heartbreaker to the Chargers week one. They tie against the Eagles, but they're 1-2-1. One, and one, And even with the rookie quarterback and some questions on both sides of the ball, they've looked competent. They've, they've pretty much been in most of the games they've played so far. You take a look at Cleveland's schedule. They have a tough matchup coming up week five, which should be fun to watch. They play Indianapolis. That game is at home. They travel to Pittsburgh week six. They travel to Cincinnati week seven. You have Las Vegas, and then you're at your bye. You come out of the bye, though. There's a lot of winnable games. Houston, Philadelphia, Jacksonville. You play both New York teams. You take a look. It did. I'm not saying that this team doesn't have to play well, but it's not like they have to be perfect the rest of the way just to maybe sneak into the playoffs. It, they could probably go seven and five and make it a 10 and six. And I, I'm sure, I, I don't know. So Matt, those teams I just named, I mean, I'm sure you're at least partially where they're scheduled to it, it. The defense needs to tighten things up that that much is for sure. I, I mean, obviously Baltimore week one, they didn't look very good. They're missing some guys. You can't let a team score 24 points in the fourth quarter like they did yesterday against Dallas. But, Matt, I think if this defense just kind of tightens things up, they could be – I'm not going to say they're going to be a dark horse because I, I need to see more out of them. But I think they could be a surprising team as we get into December and then and then if they make it, maybe even January. Yeah, I'm looking at their schedule right now, Ryan. I, I agree about the defense – if you look at what they've allowed in the first four games, obviously the Baltimore, you're going to give up right around 40 points. They give up 38. The giving up 30 to Cincinnati was kind of a, a, a question mark. Uh, and even 38 in a game that you kind of put away early yesterday, kind of isn't ideal. I agree with the schedule. I think there's a, a lot of tough back-to-backs in there. You mentioned the Jacksonville uh, game that's the first of a, a road back to back with Tennessee. I, I think that's a little harder than it looks on paper. You, you play back to back games at MetLife, which that stadium and that sticky turf is has shown that it, it could get the best of anyone. Uh, so that isn't as easy just from a perspective of trying to stay healthy, not so much the quality of teams you're playing. It, it, so here's where I'm at, Ryan. And you might be able to help me out here. I don't know how good I, Pittsburgh's obviously three and zero, but I don't really know how to gauge them either in this division because they're three and zero. But this is a team in Pittsburgh that I think is kind of similar to Cleveland, except they just have different strengths. So I, I, I could see either one of those teams falling off pretty quickly. I, I could see one of them sneaking in at ten and six but I don't think both of them will even in this expanded playoff format because now you got to factor in new England as a wild card team. You got to factor in a couple other potential dark horses, Indianapolis. So the games you mentioned, Indianapolis, Pittsburgh are going to be the swing games for this Cleveland team. Uh, But I, I, I don't know how to gauge the Steelers just yet. So I'm leaving the window open for Cleveland to go in there and take it. Uh, especially since they have both games against Pittsburgh left on their schedule. So I don't think the Colts game is going to be as much of an indicator, Ryan. I think the week six game at Pittsburgh is going to be the real mile mile marker for what this Cleveland team is, because it's one thing to win games outside of your division and and go in and beat a Dallas team, but to to win games in in a tough division that they're in, in the AFC North, I think that speaks more volumes than 
winning at Dallas, especially with the way Dallas has been playing too. So I'm going to wait and see. So ask me again on October 19th what I think about the Browns. I'm just going to make a note right here in a post a note to ask you again on October 19th. You look that's, on the other side. And for those wondering the random date, that's when the day after they play the Steelers. So, but I don't like this team just hasn't done like they've we've seen kind of teases from this team in the past ever since they loaded up on this talent and they've kind of teased everyone and then fell off or in some cases came on really late after a slow start. So, I don't know. They're really benefiting though from playing a a weaker schedule. That's for sure. So I'm just taking a look through their schedule. I'm not, I don't know how long I'm going to do this. I'm trying to find the last time this team started three and one in a season. And I have and I'm not to... taken any, I'm not taking anything away from their start. Don't get me wrong, but you play two NFC East teams. That isn't anything to, to hold in high esteem this year. It's, it's definitely Ryan, the best start they've had in, the better part of a decade, I would imagine. Matt, you would have to I, I, I go can't remember the last than that. Yeah. I'm all the way back so, to 2007. I can't find the last time they started three and one. So it's definitely a, an encouraging sign. I, I'm happy that I've been hearing in, I've been hearing about this Cleveland team, Ryan, since we were doing the warm up back on, on WMCX. It had to be either our junior year when Nick Halper came in and was talking about the Browns. I think that was the first mention of this Cleveland team kind of coming on. Uh, and then I've been hearing about this, this Browns team every single year and they've missed the playoffs every single year that I've been hearing about them. So the one, the one disappointing thing would be, and obviously there's bigger pandemic factors that, that weigh into this, but to have Cleveland make the playoffs, but most of their fans won't be able to go and enjoy it that would be kind of like the the air out of the tire kind of thing after this playoff drought that they're on. But I don't know. It's it's definitely out there. But like I said, to open up the point uh, with your initial question, you got to go out there and beat the teams that you're supposed to beat. And if they do, I could see 10 wins. I really can. So did you find that number, Ryan? Yeah, the last so- time? Matt, the last time the Browns started three and one in a season, we were four years old. It was 2001. And here's a fun fact for you. Their offensive coordinator that year was Bruce Arians. So that's a fun fact. Now they ended that season seven and nine on the back of a four game losing streak to start off December. So hopefully that doesn't happen again this year, but the one positive thing you can say for the Browns, they've started off well They've come out of the gate strong. That's what they need to do. The team on the other sideline, they have not started the season strong. They could make the case that for all intents and purposes, this team should be 0-4. They were very lucky to get out of Atlanta with a win. Other than that, this team would not have a win yet this season. They struggled against a Rams team that seems to be pretty solid. As I said, they got out of Atlanta. They lose to Seattle last week, and now they lose to Cleveland this week. Mike McCarthy just said today, actually about 15 minutes or so ago, we're a come from behind team. As I stand in front of you, that's not the way you win consistently. That will not be our approach. That's for sure. And according to Todd Archer, this is the seventh time the Cowboys have started one or three or worse in the Jerry Jones era. And only once have they made the playoffs. And that was 1996. This is a, this is a very difficult team to gauge the offense obviously looks very good but it takes them a long time to get things going as you alluded to earlier the defense looks historically bad that doesn't seem like it, they can stop anybody which is obviously very concerning the offense has been okay but the defense i think the defense is last in wpa when probability added Matt, we talked, it wasn't just us. I mean, all the analysts this year kind of looked at the NFC East and said, okay, Dallas on paper, they're clearly the most talented team. They should have no problems winning this division. I mean, they're still in it because the division is very, very bad. But I don't, I mean, Matt, the problem with this team for me is that you can see that the talent is there on both sides of the ball times, that they just have problems putting it together for an extended period of time. Like you see like a few minutes stretch where like everything's going well on both sides, but then it just, 
Nah, I, I don't know. It, it just boggles my mind that a team with this talent level is performing like this. It just doesn't make sense to me. This team should be way better. They should be, they should have a stranglehold on the NFC East and, and they don't. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to be the voice of reason for every Dallas Cowboys slash St. Louis Cardinals slash Oklahoma Sooner fan out there. Mm-hmm. Ready for this? Their schedule the rest of the way is probably the easiest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. You still have all six games within the NFC East, which again, we talked about is awful. So there are six winnable games right off the bat. On top of that, you play a struggling Arizona team at home on Monday night. You play at Minnesota, a team that for all intents and purposes is not going to be good this year. You play at Cincinnati, another game that you should win. I just gave you t- like nine wins right there, Ryan. You can't. So boom, I, don't I think just saw. I solved the Cowboys certainty. season. I solved the Cowboys season right there. Their schedule is laughably easy. They they have not played a game in the division yet. Matt, the problem is like and, I don't trust this team to win in this division. Oh, like, I don't Ryan, trust any, the, Matt, you can't the trust Giants any have team scored forty-seven division. points. The Giants have scored forty-seven points all season and you're going to sit there and tell me that that's not guaranteed two wins for the Cowboys. Yeah. But who's to say that they don't find the leaky holes in Dallas's defense this week. Who's to say Daniel Jones can't find open receivers half the time because he's getting sacked because their offensive line's garbage. So it's just I, I, this defense is, I'm not even going to say it's bad. As I said, it's historically bad. Like I this, get that. You have Ryan, to try I get hard. that. But Bill, Bill used to win with historically bad defenses in New England because he had a good offense. So I've seen but that that's, happen. That's Bill. That's, that's okay. Well, Bill, yeah. Mike Sorry, McCarthy Mike McCarthy is not Bill. But Ryan, you can't sit there and look at this schedule and, and not tell me that they're going to be in the mix by the end of the year. I mean, they'll they're, be in the mix, but they'll Ryan, be in the mix because the division's so bad. Ryan, the Eagles won a game, their first game of the season yesterday, and went from worst to first. So, like, I, I can't imagine that this Dallas team is at any point going to be out of the playoff race uh, because the Eagles, and we'll talk about your birds, they didn't show me enough to sit there and say they're going to win this division. I get Dallas hasn't played well this year, but I'm just going to keep looking at the schedule. So, any sooner cardinal cowboy fan out there look at your schedule and it'll make you feel better you play the giants in the in the football team twice each that's four wins right there those might be tough games for this team if they can't get, like put a whole full 60 minutes together you don't you could put together a good six minutes and beat the giants you don't Listen, even need a you, you need one good quarter the NFC Rams East divisional games are always tough. They're always a bloodbath. You never know what you're no, going to get out of them. Not this year. Anything it, can happen. The The Cowboys have basically a Pro Bowl roster on their offense. I, I'm not worried about them to, to out. And if you get into a shootout, Ryan, you talk about the defense being historically bad. You're going to get into a shootout with Daniel Jones, Dwayne Haskins, and Carson Wentz. And two of the, the three quarterbacks I just named aren't going to put up as many points as Dak Prescott in this offense. So, and I would be even more inclined to say all three. So I could see them going six and zero in the division. I really can. I, I don't see how that's not a, a possibility because we went into this year. They're the preseason favorite. They have all this talent on offense. I don't care how bad the defense is. No team in this division other than the Cowboys has been able to consistently score points. So if you're going to get into a shootout, that's fine. You're still going to win all those games. I just think, listen, from someone that did pick the Cowboys to win this division pretty handedly, I need to see more from this team before I buy back in because this has been an embarrassing start for America's team. They could realistically be five and three going into the second week in November, the giants Cardinals football team and Eagles next four games. Win, 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 win. I could make the argument that I see three losses there. Arizona is the only game I could see them probably losing or at Philly just as a random in division loss. But again, they're much better. And 
I usually don't do the, the this this kind of plain thinking here of they're the better team, so they're going to win. But they are much, much better than some of these teams. So I'm going to use this plain, you know, black and white thinking here of they should win these games. Where's the they third loss? Win the games. I don't. Where's know the third they'll... loss out of that, Ryan? I think. I think Washington oh, at Washington stop. could be a sneaky stop. tough game. I think it could be sneaky tough. Stop it! Can you name ten players on the Washington football team? Ten. Can you name ten players? Would you Would you actually like me to try to name ten players on the Washington football team? But you have to look at me, so I know you're not looking at you know the roster. Okay. You got yeah. Chase Young. Okay, can I, and can you I, can, can make up some of these names, and they'd probably be on the team. Can I say Alex Smith? Is that allowed? Because he is on the team. I'll give it to you. That okay, Alex Smith. That checks out. You got Dwayne Haskins. Yeah. Terry McLaurin, Antonio okay, well, Gibson. That's five. Ryan Kerrigan. Oh, we're, there we go. Logan Thomas. Okay. Um, uh, who's the they uh the defensive lineman? They have like a lot of them. Hold on. I couldn't even tell you. No, they okay. I gotta look at the right. That's gonna kill me. Now. Oh, that you gotta. No, I, I lost seven? already. I lost already. That's fine. JD McKissich, I think, is a, is another is. guy on the team. Jonathan Allen, that's who I was thinking of. And Deron Payne and Montez Sweat. They have a good line. I'll give it that. They have a very good defensive yeah. line. I so you just named like four Alabama guys right there, or like all SEC guys at least. Um, yeah, I, I don't think any person in this country right now can name 10 players on the Washington football team. So you're telling me that they're going to beat the Dallas Cowboys. They could, you could no, make, you no could way. make a case that if certain things happen. Yeah, and you know could. what the, and the, the, the Cardinals sooner Cowboy fan will probably agree with you too. Uh, they were not happy yesterday on, on the tweet world uh, about this game, but I just, I can't see this being the trend all year. I, I find it really hard to believe that they won't win this division by, you know what? Hot take time, sound the alarm, Ryan, by two games. They will win the division by two games in by the end of the year. Hot you take. Know what, hot you know take what, Matt? We're, we're going to go out of order here because we'll talk about the other team in the division that won yesterday, and it was the Philadelphia Eagles, who, as you kindly noted, went from worst to first. The Eagles are now first place in the NFC East with a 1-2-1 and record. The Philadelphia Eagles are, if the season ended today, would be NFC East Division champions. They are in first place, the Eagles, first place team. They beat the San Francisco 49ers 25-20. to And Matt, I have pounded my fist on the table. I am buying back into the Philadelphia Eagles. I was out of it for the last three weeks, but I'm buying back in. I really think this team can make a run. Not going to say they're going to run the table, but this team, I'm confident with the guys that they have. Offensive line looked good. Wentz looked better. Doug was aggressive. Defense was solid. I'm buying back in. I got the confidence back. My serotonin levels are on the rise. I haven't been this thrilled in a long time. I'm buying back in. You look at this, the Eagles' upcoming schedule, Matt. They could definitely beat Pittsburgh. I know Pittsburgh just had a bye but I think they could beat Pittsburgh coming up. Baltimore, that could be a game they could win. You got New York and Dallas. Those are probably two more wins. You come out of the bye against New York, that's another win. You beat Cleveland. You beat Seattle. You go to Green Bay, that's a win. You beat New Orleans. You beat Arizona. You beat Dallas again. You probably lose to Washington because they have the division wrapped up by that point. But I'm buying back in. This team is going to the playoffs this year. That's it. They're winning the division. Yeah, so I didn't know this until I watched this game. Uh, they basically have every player that the Green Bay Packers didn't want off their practice squad. Travis Fulgham, don't know who he was until yesterday, but he got all the points away from Greg Ward in fantasy, so thanks, everybody. I, I'm going to lose this week because of that. Uh, uh, Richard Rodgers, another guy that Aaron Rodgers didn't really care to throw to anymore, so... Wasn't he the guy that that botched the uh, the onside kick when they were in Seattle in the NFC Championship game? Yes. Wasn't he that guy? Yeah. So they got him too. That's cool. Uh, Brian, you were gifted this game. Uh, Nick Mullins decided to take the ball and throw it directly to your defender uh, and look at him the whole way. Uh, they they fell apart instantly in the fourth quarter. The 49ers did. 
CJ Beathard almost let him back. So don't sit there and say, oh, you know, the Eagles are this great team. CJ Beathard came in like halfway through the fourth quarter, halfway through the fourth quarter, went 14 of 19 for 138 yards. Uh, so don't sit there and tell me this defense is going to be some great, you know, next coming. The Eagles uh, just want to make it a competitive game for the national audience. That's all they were doing. Carson Wentz, you were roasting him for a good majority of the game. And actually, let me pull up some messages here uh, from you live texting us during the game yesterday. You said, uh, let's see, great radio right here. You were, you, you said convinced we should just start running the triple option. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you wanted to run the triple option. You, uh, at one point, we're hyping them up. Now we're talking about Philly accents. Uh, you said at 825, this team sucks. Yeah, they did. They, they did not look good the first drive. They of went the game. from sucks to the best team in the division, just like well, that. If you want to keep going on this text chain at 929 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I just don't see how the Eagles lose another game this season, honestly. Yeah, okay. Nathan Gary still plays considerable minutes for this team. And you're Listen, sit there and I've say, been an adamant proponent of starting Sean Bradley over Nathan Gary. I don't know why the Eagles haven't listened to me yet. I'm hoping that they do. Nothing. Again, Nathan Gary seems like a great guy, but I think Sean Bradley is clearly the better player. Call it bias, whatever. I find it very hard to believe that he would not be very good as a linebacker in this system. But Matt, I'm uh, I'm buying back in. Wentz looked Wentz looked better. There were still some throws. I'm going to bring it back a little bit after after what I just did. But there are some throws that Wentz made that still maybe want to bang my head against the wall. But that dime that he threw to Travis Fulgham, new household wide receiver name, it's just it brought a tear to my eye, Matt. It was just that that was the Wentz that we saw three years ago in 2017 and that's the ones that we haven't seen much of recently so if he can just get to doing that consistently this team can do something listen it all it, it, this all ultimately revolves around Wentz if Wentz can do what he did yesterday for the most part as I said there are some things that happen that you still like to see him get better at and improve upon but if he can get Back to that level. I'm not even saying he has to be at an MPP level, but if he can just be like, if he can just be better, if he can just kind of show the like that same throw that he made to Fulgham, the team will be fine. I think the offensive line with Val Peters actually did pretty well. I'm confident Jordan Mulata. I thought I, you know, there were a couple, there was uh, some things that I think he could work on, but I really think that he'll be a solid left tackle for us for the foreseeable future. Lane Johnson kind of missed some time, but that showed us Jack Driscoll, who I'm very confident in. I think he could be another Hal Pulavali Vitae kind of guy, and maybe even a little better than that. He's kind of showed me a lot of positive things to take away over the first four weeks. I think once you get Goddard back, once you get some of these receivers back, this should be a, a pretty solid team. So don't sleep on the Philadelphia Eagles. Don't sleep on the 49ers either. They're missing so many people, but once those guys get healthy, they'll they'll be fine. Don't worry. They'll they'll be in the playoff hunt. But yeah, it's uh, as the first Eagles victory that I've seen in 280 days, I think the number was. So it was nice. I'm taking full advantage of it. Yeah, the Cowboys are going to win your division by two games. So We'll uh... see. We'll see. Carson Wentz didn't even look that good. He, he, all right, he threw stop. for Just 193 stop. yards. It ain't about the yards. It's about the process. Now trust the process. Miles Sanders only had 46 yards on the ground. That's fine. Wasn't That's a great offensive output from you guys. You scored 25 points. Listen, that was a tough game against a depleted San Francisco defense. That's they still got some guys on the defense. That that listen. Your defense gave up. A combined 301 passing yards to Nick Mullins and CJ Beathard. So traveling that's not across good. the country, that's a good win against a good team that nobody expected the Eagles to win. They were, I think, nine point underdogs going into it. Good team win gives them the momentum they need to make a run. Yeah. The the worst thing that America needs right now is a competent Philadelphia Eagles fan base. So 
Yeah, I don't know, Ryan. Congrats. Congrats on your first win and going from worst to first. It's truly a, a Cinderella story from week to week, for sure. The Rams defeated the Giants 17-9. to The Giants suck. They have a losing culture. If you don't think they have a losing culture, you're an idiot. The Colts beat the Bears 19-11. to And just what was it? What a game, really. I, I feel bad for the people that couldn't check out that game. That was very entertaining. I want to make a quick point about the Chargers and the Buccaneers. I think we can talk about that for a little bit. Um, because the Chargers, Matt, uh, well, for, I'll start with the Buccaneers. The Buccaneers, they look pretty good. The defense, I know they left 31 points, but the defense looks solid. Brady looked pretty good, if I do say so myself, through five touchdowns. But the Chargers, Matt, I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to get it out in the open. Justin Herbert looks way better than I thought he would look. I don't know who this Justin Herbert is, but he's not the guy that I expected, especially considering all the circumstances, the way he was told that he would be the starting quarterback. And, man, he's making some throws that that are very impressive. I mean, that, that I don't know if I'm going to be wrong about Justin Herbert, but right now he has proven me wrong. He has been very competent at the quarterback position. He's keeping this team competitive. He's keeping this team in games. They did lose Austin Eckler. He's probably going to be out for multiple weeks. They did only have 46 rushing yards on the ground, and 14 of those came from Herbert. But, Matt, I think this Chargers team, they started one and three. I don't think – I don't know if they're going to make the playoffs, but they've been competitive. And I think you watch this guy that you put some draft capital in, hoping that he could be your franchise quarterback, and so far he's proven that organization right. Yeah, so somewhere uh, in southern New Jersey or central New Jersey, Zach Casenza is listening to this and saying, I told you so, uh, to the man who has hated Justin Herbert for some time. Granted, Zach also thinks Herbert's like the best quarterback to come out since like Andrew Luck. I don't know about that. But I will give Mr. Casenza some credit where credit's due. Herbert looks good. Looks very good. Uh, to go into Tampa Bay and to have a hot start like they did, you looked really solid. I don't know how they're going to handle. So here's the thing is if Terod Taylor was going to come back and play, Anthony Lynn said he's, he's going to be the guy. But after what Herbert's done recently and especially yesterday, you can't go back to Terod Taylor. You can't. You're going to lose the team and the fan base instantly. You feel bad for Terod Taylor, especially because it was his own medical team that punctured his lung and caused him to miss a game or whatever that crazy story has turned into. But Herbert is going to be the guy the rest of the year, probably going to be a viable fantasy option too. He has some pretty good receiving targets to throw to too. So it's he's got some, some weapons uh, to utilize in the passing game. Uh, Eckler going down sucks for them, but Josh Kelly, a guy from UCLA, is still a really capable guy to go out there and run the ball. Uh, talking about Tampa Bay, Ryan, uh, Tom looks great. Uh, he, this was the game I was able to watch a lot of, uh, since it was up in a New York market, they had this game on, uh, Tom looked good. The, so I will say objectively the first half the offense for Tampa Bay, or excuse me, Tampa Bay did not look good at all. Uh, a lot of three and outs, a lot of dump off screen passes, a lot of drop balls. Uh, of course, Mike Evans got hurt initially, came back. Um, Ronald Jones had a nice day on the ground. Tom looked good in the second half. And I think that's what you want to see. Uh, if Tampa, uh, excuse me, again, Tampa Bay, if Tampa Bay could get really good production like they did in the second half. This will be a team that I think could win the division. I mean, New Orleans looked good. We'll talk about them too, but they they look better than the Saints do right now. This is a good come from behind win. And the offense is starting to look more and more in sync. We knew it was going to take a couple weeks, maybe even a month or two for uh, Tom to get settled in. But this is... I I saw this stat line and I was trying as a Patriots fan to remember the last time he played like this. 
And and you got to go back. I don't even really count a lot of the games last year. It's this was a performance like vintage Tom Brady. So Buccaneers fans, you still have you still have a good quarterback. It's not like he's aging rapidly like Drew Brees is. So I, I couldn't tell you the last time Tom played like this in a Patriots uniform. That's for sure. So we're going to stay in the NFC South, Matt. We're going to talk about the Saints and Lions game before we move on to the final game. And the Saints did not inspire a lot of confidence early on. They went down quickly, 14 to nothing. And then I think they scored, I want to say, 35 on answer points. So, okay, I need to make the preface by saying that the Saints, after going down early, they looked more like I thought they would going into the year. But Matt, Matt Patricia sucks. Like, I don't know how this guy still has a job. I, like, I don't know what he does exactly for this Detroit team. I don't know how he's still there. I don't know how they haven't fired him yet. And listen, this is coming from a big Matt Patricia guy. This is a guy that I wanted the Eagles to look at before they hired Doug. But this guy is awful. He's clearly one of the worst head coaches in the league right now. I feel like the team is suffering because he's there. And I feel like this team's not going to get any better until they fire him. Because you take a look at this Detroit team. They, you can make the case that they shouldn't be one and three. They should have won the Bears game week one. The Packers game, they, I, I don't think they were ever going to win that, but they barely, they barely beat Arizona. And when you go up fourteen nothing on the Saints, you have to keep that momentum going. You can't let them score thirty five on answer. That's unacceptable. And after the game, I will say this: Matt Patricia said that he has work to do and he has to figure it out quickly but I don't know how you can see what this guy has done in his time there in Detroit. Of course, you remember they fired Jim Caldwell to bring in this guy. I, I, I don't see how you can in any way make the argument that this is the guy that you want leading your franchise. It's just, I, I don't yeah. think you can make the argument. No. So the, the thing with Patricia and we saw it with a couple other guys like Todd Bowles, uh, they make great coordinators, but not great head coaches. And I think in this case, especially Detroit. And I remember about a month ago, Ryan, we talked ourselves into Detroit being a sneaky playoff team. So I don't really see how Patricia can't put this together, especially on the defensive side of the ball, which is what his calling card is. Ryan, you look top down on their defense. They have a lot of really good players. Obviously you bring in Jamie Collins and Danny Shelton and Deron Harmon, all really good players on that Patriots defense. Reggie Ragland, another guy who is a pretty solid defensive player. You draft Jeff Okuda. Uh, obviously he's still getting his feet wet, but you have a really good defense and to allow 35 consecutive points. I don't know if that's more of a testament to the, the the defense or just the offense not being able to consistently put up points that's that's been what Detroit struggled with for so many years and it's I I feel bad for Patricia I think like Todd Bowles he, he's going to find his way back as a uh, as a coordinator but I I just don't I don't see this going the full season I, I really don't it's a shame too because for, for a brief time, you thought maybe he could really turn this this team around, but I don't know what it is. And they still can't run the ball. I, I can, and I said this before, not in our lifetime have we seen the, the Detroit Lions be able to run the football effectively. Matt Stafford only had 206 yards passing. Uh, yeah, I, they need to bring in an offensively minded coach to fix this team. Because I don't think, and I know you allowed 35 points, but it's not the defense, at least in my opinion. So, Matt, here's a statistic for it. Sunday was the fifth straight game that the Lions held a double-digit lead and lost, which is an NFL record. Actually, when they lost against the Packers, that set the NFL record, and so now they're just extending their own record. They've lost 14 of their last 16 games under Patricia. And their only win, as I said, was that victory against Arizona where they had to come from behind. I, so you're a Patriots fan. So I'm going to ask you this because I've seen this take thrown around a lot recently, especially because this dude is struggling so much. I've seen the take that Patricia might not even be as good of a coordinator as 
people think he is because as soon as he left New England, the defense got better. So what's your opinion on that take? Um, for the people who think that or the, the, the defense last year for New England benefited a lot from kind of lucky breaks with turnovers and the fact that they played eight bad teams to start out the year. I'm not taking anything away from what the New England defense did. Uh, but I think there's a lot of factors that go into it besides that. I, I think Patricia also benefited from the fact that we we hear Josh McDaniels, we hear Bill Belichick, and we heard Patricia for so many years, but the guys right underneath them, Brian Flores, right? Flores was right underneath Patricia for a number of years. Uh, you have all kinds of other guys, Steve Belichick, Gerard Mayo on the coaching staff now. So it wasn't all Patricia's doing. And, and I will say that right towards the end of Patricia's time there, they go out and they get Stefan Gilmore, which was by far the biggest defensive acquisition probably in the past decade for New England. I, I think, you know, I, I think Patricia is a good football mind. But if you ask me right now who I want calling the plays defensively, I would take Brian Flores over Matt Patricia in, in terms of past guys to come through New England. Uh, now it's kind of like a group think between three guys, Steve and Bill Belichick and Gerard Mayo. But if you ask me right now between the past two main guys that New England had, I would take Flores over Patricia. I just can't see... Like, I, I know a lot of New England players followed him there, but he just seems like kind of a like a brash guy, you know, kind of like a – you know what I mean by that? He just seems kind of – and there's a word that I would use, but we're, we're a family-friendly show. He's kind of a blank, and you could fill in the – at least that's what he seems like. He seems cocky. He seems so, – he went out – there's a popular I, quote. He's like, I have one of the biggest defensive plays in Super Bowl history – I'll, I know what I'm doing. Like, no, it was Malcolm Butler reading the play and coming up with an interception at the goal line. Like that wasn't all he was wasn't out there on the field and Malcolm had to be, have the awareness to go out and make that interception. So I don't know. I just feel like he's like strangely cocky for some reason this year. He, he wasn't really like that in New England. So I don't know where, where this kind of came from. He also just doesn't like the media. So I'm glad he, well, I want to say Bill this. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I watched this guy's press conferences and to an extent they kind of remember me, they kind of remind me, there we go, of Chip Kelly's press conferences. But when Chip Kelly was at Oregon, really his whole entire career, what he's had to do a press conference, he's, I, I'm not going to say Chip was short with the media, but he, he's pretty witty when it comes to dealing with the media. And the difference between Chip and Patricia is that I don't, I never took Chip as being arrogant. And as you, that's that's the thing I take when I watch Patricia talk in in any type of press conference setting. He, there's no reason for him to act like he's this this big huge success. I get that what he's done with the defense in New England when he was there, but no, but I think it, there's a lot of other people there too. And, and I'm going to keep saying I'm not taking anything away from what Patricia did, but there's a lot of other people that have gotten other jobs in the NFL because of that same defense. So it's not just him. If my advice to Matt Patricia, because I'm sure he's listening to this, just maybe, maybe take a step back and realize that you're not this great football genius that you seem to think that you are. And that would be my take. It's not like he's a, because people obviously want to play for him. If half the Patriots defense went there within the past three years, and then on the offense, Danny Amendola went there too. You look top down, a lot of team, what players from that New England team uh, that he was on followed him there. So clearly he's something we don't see because we see the media aspect of it and he's kind of a cocky guy, but probably in the locker room is probably a good coach to be, to be around, I guess. But like he comes off, Ryan, as just uh, not, a, not a nice guy. So I don't know. It's... We'll see. I, I really find it hard to believe that Detroit is going to have a lot of patience for this guy, especially because you missed out on guys like Kevin Stefanski last year in the offseason who's having success in Cleveland. So you're running out of a lot of you know hot coaching options. Uh, and if you want to stay on the defensive side of all, I think Robert Sala, a guy who 
obviously is the defensive guy at uh, San Francisco. It could be a good option, but I, I think this team needs an offensive minded head coach. I, I don't think they should go defense. We've seen them with Jim Schwartz, Jim Schwartz for a number of years. Uh, go to an offensive mind and see what happens. And didn't they Ten. fire um, Caldwell after going 10 and six or nine and seven? They, they fired they him had after a, a winning record, season. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't, I don't really know Caldwell's background too much, but in terms of being an offensive or defensive guy, but I, I, I couldn't really make sense of that, um, that move to, to get rid of him. Um, I, I think in hindsight, obviously it's 2020, but I think Detroit probably would have wanted to stick with Caldwell for another year or two to see what happened. I don't really I know. So just as an FYI, if you hear anything in the background, the, the, Mighty recycling truck is now outside of my house, just in case. Yeah, they need new brakes. I heard that all the way <laughs> from here. The Houston Texans fell to 0-4. So this was a great game going into the two 0-3 teams, Minnesota and Houston. Minnesota picked up a win, so at least they'll they kind of stay in the, the playoff hunt, although it's going to be tough for them to rebound. Houston, it's done. It's over. Their season's over. The, what does Bill O'Brien have to do this year to get fired? What do you think? Or is he just safe? Well, he would have to fire himself, right? Is this, isn't he the, the GM like, too? I don't, know, I, I don't know how you can look at this guy and say, like, what has he done really over his time? Deshaun Watson. I get Deshaun Watson got that big extension, but like, why would I want to be in – in this system for so many years, you gotta, you gotta get out, man. I mean, this is, they're not doing him any favors whatsoever. I, I, Bill O'Brien Ryan is another Belichick disciple. Um, this one more so than Patricia, I, I think has this cocky attitude and he thinks he knows what he's doing. Uh, he's another guy like Matt who is trying to outsmart everyone I don't know what he was trying to outsmart us with by trading DeAndre Hopkins. I know we've talked about it almost every single week when we talk about the Texans, but like, come on, man. Like, you can't sit there and tell me that 16 carries for 63 yards from David Johnson is the same as, you know, what DeAndre Hopkins can bring to your football team. Like, come on. Like, that's you're, that's just silly. Uh, it's it's a long list of players they, they dealt for next to nothing. I don't really know what he does as a GM. It doesn't make sense. As a coach, it doesn't really make sense either. It's – you got to – ownership's got to step in here, Ryan. I, I get you had a tough schedule to begin the year, but like 0-4 after trading away your best player, not a good look PR-wise, that's for sure. I just don't know what this guy has done to warrant this this seemingly long he, leash. He came he won in, a he won a mediocre division, Ryan, and got them to and, the playoffs well, to and play the on the opening game at four thirty on ESPN every single year. Well, that's that's what he does. Too. He gets in. So he made the playoffs in twenty fifteen. I don't mean to cut you off, but it just pisses me off so much that there's other good candidates and that this guy still holds a job. Twenty fifteen said he won the a bad division at nine and seven, and then they got shut out thirty to nothing by the Chiefs. And that was in 2015. The next year, once again, they win a bad division at nine and seven. They beat Oakland, who, as you remember, this was because Derek Carr was injured, so they didn't have a quarterback. They beat Oakland, and then they get blown out by New England in the divisional round. They go four and twelve in 2017. They go eleven and five in 2018, only to lose in the wild card round. In 2019, last year, they go 10 and 6. The only reason they won that playoff game is because the Bills started a fullback at quarterback that day. So, oh, I don't, and then stop once it, they it, let up Ryan. 51 points, I need to make that clear. They let up 51 points the next week. And I get it's against the Chiefs, but who you can't let up 51 points in a playoff game. So, I don't know. I don't know how owner, I, I guess maybe ownership's just content about just getting into the playoffs. And listen, if that's the case, I'm 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 sorry if you're part of that fan base because that's unacceptable because there's a lot you of owners remember, like that in sports. Yeah, you got to remember too. This is a Houston team that is still relatively new when you compare it to other franchises in terms of just being around. So I guess going to the playoffs is like the big thing. 
I get that, but it's I, been like they, 20 because years. The only other time that they had a decent team was when Matt Schaub was there, right? Him and Andre Johnson, and like Arian Foster. That was the only other time they were like decent. So I, I, I guess I could see being happy with making the playoffs, but like you're still not going to make the playoffs this year. Uh, there's other teams that are actively getting better with, uh, I think, less money being involved too. I mean, you look at Tennessee. I mean, a lot of those guys, I get you just paid Ryan Tannehill, you know, half the the world bank, but like that team, that Tennessee team last year, arguably was the best team in that division. And they were running on a lot of younger players and a lot of guys that kind of got on the waiver wire and stuff like that and free agency. And with Houston, it's, it's funny how they just like to run it back with the same formula and the same team run and get the same result. And this is, I guess, strengthening your argument. It's like a weird sense of complacency. No, not really. I don't understand it. I, and it's, we talk about Patricia. We talk about Adam Gase a lot. We talk about Bill O'Brien. Out of those three guys, Ryan, you can make a strong case. Bill O'Brien is at the top of the list for people that, you know, need to kind of get a change of scenery. That's a good way of saying, you know, that they need to get rid of them, right? There's no reason why this is justified. If I'm a Texans fan, I'm looking there. I'm saying, what the hell, man? You traded away our best player, Ryan, with a little sneeze there. Uh, bless you. You good now? Oh, you, good. you couldn't hear it because he, I guess he muted his volume there. But in any case, Ryan, imagine imagine the Phillies, right? Because the Eagles don't really have a player of like DeAndre Hopkins magnitude, right? So imagine the Phillies. You trade Bryce Harper for like, I don't know, who's an old aging player in baseball that you train him for like Brett Gardner, right? And then you start 0-10 just to make it because it's 162 game season. You start 0-10. What do you think the Philadelphia landscape is calling for in that scenario? Um, they wouldn't be too happy. So to translate it over, I, I don't know why the fan base isn't sitting there saying like, what the hell you traded away Hopkins for, and I get there's more things that go into it. The play calling isn't always great. Uh, Bill wasn't always the best play caller when he was in new England either. Uh, I, I could always remember Brady liking Josh McDaniels a lot more than Bill O'Brien. So I, I don't, they're bad, Ryan. It's bad. It, it's it's kind of just laughable because it's not like you could sit there and say like, oh, Bill O'Brien's going to get fired kind of thing this season. He's there. Like you're, you, Houston fans, you're stuck with this man. You're, you're, they're just running back the same team, the same formula every year. Romeo Cornell still there. I don't, I don't know how. Like you're, you're running back the same thing every year. The Vikings, nice win there, I guess. So Matt Cousins team. is he? So we're not. So Dalvin we're not Cook looked great Cousins. though. Dalvin Cook looked great though. Um, he did. Adam Thielen, I'm happy he's starting. My big question mark with Adam Thielen, Ryan, was without Diggs whether or not he was still going to get those targets. But it looks like Justin Jefferson is kind of on the scene now. He had over 100 yards receiving. So if I'm a Vikings fan, I'd be semi encouraged by that, I guess. But. Bad, 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 bad from Houston. That's for sure. A team that's that's good, good, good is the Buffalo Bills. The last game that we have to talk about. They won thirty to twenty three over the Las Vegas Raiders, who fell to two and two on the season. Josh Allen, not his not his best game of the year, but still enough to get the job done. Another couple of pa touchdown passes. He ran in for another one. Defense did what it needed to do. This team started 4-0 for the first time since 2008. Of course, people will remember that was the year that they had Trent Edwards and J.P. Lossman. So the quarterback situation this year is, is a little better than what they had to go through that year. And people will also remember that year that they finished 7-9 and on the back of a four-game losing streak and a three-game losing streak shortly after their bye week. 
Matt, I think that this Bills team is for real. They'd have to do they they they'd have to try hard to screw this up. Clearly, I think they're making the playoffs. Are they going to win the division? I don't know. I have to see more New England. But this is this is a good Buffalo team. Josh Allen took the steps that he needed to take to become a good quarterback. Mechanically, he looks better. And all fast, he looks more confident. He looks more knowledgeable. It's just this. This is a good team. This is a dangerous team. As long as they can keep it up, you know, injuries pending. This is a good team. Although we'll really start to see soon just how good this Buffalo team is because they've played the Jets, they've played the Dolphins, they've played the Rams, who obviously are a tough team. The Raiders you can make the case, but coming up, you play at Tennessee. You have a big Thursday night game. What might end up being one of the best Thursday night games of the season when they played the Chiefs. You travel to the Jets, and then you play New England, Seattle, and Arizona before the bye. So we're going to find out real quickly if this team is actually for real, which I think that they are. I know they haven't played the best teams, but I think that this team has shown that they're for real. Or we're going to see if they stumble a bit. But still, if you're a Bills fan, there's a lot to be excited about. There's a lot of great players on both sides of the ball. You have a great coaching staff, clearly. I don't know if, if I'm going to go for, so far to say that this is the Bills' year, but clearly there's a lot of positives that are building around this team. Yeah, uh, the one throw in the fourth quarter to Diggs deep down the field, I thought really encompasses the next steps that Josh Allen has taken uh, that ball is right there for Diggs. We talked about his deep ball accuracy at the beginning of the year. Uh, put it right where it needed to be. Uh, I, I think right now they're better than the Patriots. I, I mean, I'm going to have, have to watch Brian Hoyer for the next couple of weeks. Uh, so they're going to have the lead there um, just out of sheer games in the standings. Um, I think when they go head to head, it'll be a nice mile marker. I think they're also going to be the better team in that respect, depending on, you know, Cam's health and everything, but listen, Buffalo's good. Do I think that they're going to really compete in the playoffs? Probably not. Uh, I will say though, Ryan, sound the alarm for a, for a hot take alert. Number two, um, this team played Baltimore in the postseason. It's not a not as much of a lock as you think it is for Baltimore. I'm gonna hot take or right there. No, it's not, not as much of a lock. Right. Yeah, not. I uh, especially with the way Baltimore kind of shies away from the spotlight in the big games. That's been the one critique with Lamar Jackson. I don't want to make this a Ravens segment here, but listen, I don't think they're too far away, Buffalo, from that number two spot in, in the AFC. I, I don't think they're that far away, and that's coming from a Patriots fan who's watched them get beat down every year for the past like decade. So I, I think that they, they're getting there. They are getting there. Uh, I think Sean McDermott definitely Ryan needs to be in a conversation for coach of the year. Like it, he, he, for whatever reason still does not get the recognition that he deserves there for what he's done to turn around that franchise. Uh, so that more than anything else, more so than the recognition of Josh Allen, he needs to get some this year, McDermott. So you're right. We'll see. Uh, if they play well against Kansas City, I think we'll, we'll elevate the are they here to stay mantra a little more. But yeah, I, 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 would, I would take them in, in some aspects over Baltimore, depending on, you know, the time of year and everything else. So yeah. Um, sorry, Zach, your Raiders aren't that good anymore, um, but Buffalo is. So it'll be interesting to see for sure. I, w I wish we could have opened the season with the Dolphins and the Jets, but we didn't. So we'll see. Are you ready to admit that Josh Allen is a, like a top 10 quarterback in the NFL? Through the first four weeks this season, he is. Yeah. Um, but but overall. Like quarterback tiers, Ryan. Are you ready to move him up yet? Yeah, he's no longer a fifth or sixth tier quarterback. Oh, he's made the adjustments. Uh, I will say, though, the one thing that they're going to need to have is a running game. And 
that wasn't present yesterday. Singletary only 55 yards on 18 carries. So you need you need to have a more present running game, I think, if you're going to compete with some of the top teams in the AFC. But it's exciting uh, uh, to see some new teams kind of come back onto the scene. Obviously, Buffalo as a franchise was really good well before we were born. So it's it's nice to see some of these teams that historically are good, but in our lifetime aren't kind of come back onto the scene, right, Ryan? It's, it's kind of the, it was the same thing with Glenn Denegris' Islanders uh, in the NHL, a te- like a team that was so good before we were born. Uh, you rolled your eyes uh, for those listening. Matt, that's another um, thing I got to add to the, 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 the Glenn Denegris reel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, no, but you, you know what I mean, though, right? I mean, these are teams that historically are good, but we haven't seen it in our lifetime so that's the the nhl case for them and then the nfl it's got to be buffalo so we'll see that's another team i like cleveland i will file them into the will see tab so that was that was our nfl discussion most of these teams are 25 percent of the way through their their 2020 schedules which is which is weird to say we're already through four weeks and uh enjoy football while it's here because it'll it'll be gone before you know it but the sport that is uh, in full swing wink wink is the mlb Ooh. postseason uh we are through the wild card series for for both uh both leagues and now we are on to the divisional series so 16 teams entered and now only eight have survived Matt, I don't remember who you predicted last week. I can say that I got five of the eight correct. I was wrong about the Yankees. You were right about the Yankees. You were right on them. I was wrong about the Marlins. That was another team you were confident in. And I was wrong about the Reds, um, who lost to the Braves. But uh, other than that, there were only two series that went three games. Oakland went 2-1 over the White Sox. San Diego took three games to beat the Cardinals, but now we have a lot of entertaining matchups for the MLB postseason. We'll start in the American League with a very intriguing series. I'd, I'd argue for me, it's probably the most intriguing series on the slate. It's Tampa Bay and New York, an AL East matchup. Tampa Bay, the one seed, and they, they've they clearly been one of the best teams in baseball all year long. The Yankees entered the year with a lot of hype, but because of a lot of injuries, they didn't have the season they expected, but still they were able to beat Cleveland in two games and they set up this really nice series coming up. Matt, I, so I was wrong about the Yankees and the wild card series. I don't think I'm going to be wrong about them this time around. I have the Rays in four games. The first pitching matchup is going to be a lot of fun to watch. It'll be Blake Snell and Garrett Cole. Glasnow going tomorrow for the Rays. The Yankees, it's to be determined as of right now. But either way, I'm really, I mean, I'm excited to watch all of these series, but I'm especially excited to see how this goes. I'm excited to see if Tampa Bay can get back to the ALCS. But Matt, you talked about it last week to not count out the Yankees, that they could be a very dangerous team. And I, t- I could definitely see a scenario now where they upend the race. I will say that. So this is sheerly just pitching on hitting in this matchup. Tampa Bay, excuse me, Tampa Bay again. Uh, some of the best pitching in the field of teams uh, between Snell and Glass now. But New York, Ryan, scored 22 runs uh, in two games. And I I said this last week, if their bats can come to play, they're going to be a tough team to beat regardless of what pitching you have. And that reared its head in game one of the wild card series with probably going to be one of the the more favored players to win the Cy Young in recent years and Shane Bieber, right? I mean, look at the year he's had and what they were able to kind of do uh, to not only him, but also that pitching staff. Um, I think... New York's going to win in five. Uh, They were my World Series pick last week. I'm going to stick with it. I I just, I don't think that people can keep up with these bats. 
obviously the style of play that it is, you're going to drop a game here and there. Um, so it's not going to be the prettiest of series. Uh, and the person to not be named, so you don't have to add it to the real Ryan, he's going to have to sweat it out. Um, but I just, a team like this, Ryan, that could score the way they can, all you need to do is get average pitching and then you should be solid. And I think that they can do that. They obviously have like one of the best postseason pitchers in recent years and Garrett Cole based off of what he did uh, in Houston. So they have enough pitching wise. I think they have a, a solid bullpen uh, and obviously the, and that person who won't be named um, has detailed how there's no off days, which is going to kind of factor into this Ryan. So that'll be interesting to see with the, the no time to really get guys on short rest or anything. It's you're going to have to put faith in your pitching staff. So I, I got New York in five. Garrett, I will say this Garrett Cole pitched exactly like you would have wanted a guy. You just paid all that money to him the off season to pitch in the opening game, 13 strikeouts. They're going to need him to do it again. And I mean, I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident that he'll he'll be able to pitch well, but I don't know. I think it's I'm all in on the Rays this year. I, I really think that if any year is going to be this year, it's going to be this one. Uh, although I will say it would be kind of nice if they could get eliminated early, just so that the Phillies could could maybe interview Eric Neander. But I digress. Uh, I know they're not going to hire him anyway. He's too forward thinking for my organization to handle. But the other matchup in the American League, Matt, this is another fun matchup. Houston and Oakland, an AL West battle. Of course, everyone knows. So everyone, not, not you know, I'm not going to, I'm a pretty humble guy, but I had picked Houston. Nobody else picked Houston. And they beat the Twins. And I think that's the only reason that Houston made it through is because they were lucky enough to play a team that hasn't won a playoff game. And I don't remember how many years. And they're going to go up against Oakland, a team that just made it past the Chicago White Sox. The White Sox gave them a run for their money, but Oakland was able to pull it out. They won 6-4 in game three. Matt, so this is, I like Oakland in this series. I, I, I do think that this will be a close matchup. I do think that Houston might give Oakland some trouble. I don't think this is just going to be a series where Oakland wins 3-0. I could definitely see it going 5 but I think I'm going to take Oakland in four games. I, I do think that Oakland is strong enough and talented enough to dispel the Astros. Said I think the Astros. I'm not going to say the Astros got lucky to play the Twins, but no, they did. You could I, say that. I, I will. So I don't here's think... here's how much of the not to cut you off the stroke of luck. Those three teams in the AL Central were not separated by a lot of games, right? Mm-hmm. So you could have realistically had a scenario where Houston could have played. Chicago and Minnesota could have been at Oakland and we could have been looking at a White Sox A's divisional series. So they did get lucky. You can say it, Ryan, but go ahead, finish your point. I was, yeah. I mean, you made the point. I, I don't think they would have won against any of the other teams that they might've played in, in the wild card series, but because they did get the twins, they, they moved on. So, so good for them. They're obviously the heel this year in the postseason series, a lot of people hate them and rightfully so, especially because they keep trying to play this underdog role that nobody likes them. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, it's because you cheated Correa and he, I don't, I, I don't, I don't even want to talk about it. It's, I, I, I don't know how they can just with a straight face, keep whatever. That's it's not, it's not worth my energy. So you, you and I t- talked about it. Um, I brought up why the social media team for them kind of embraces this underdog role and like stay mad at us kind of thing. You brought up the point, which I agree with that I didn't think of initially is just to get interactions and reactions, but from a a pure PR perspective, Ryan, um, I don't know if I would want my franchise after getting caught up in the biggest cheating scandal in like a hundred years to get cocky about it and be like oh stay mad at us kind of thing like congratulations you beat the minnesota twins right and 
a team that has not won a playoff game since we were like little children, Ryan, to put that in perspective. So I don't like want to sit there and, and pat them on the back and say, congratulations. You want a postseason series. Like you beat the twins without cheating. Congratulations. Let's see you play a good team. Uh, I think this will be a five-game series, though, Ryan. I, I do agree. Oakland will, will squeak it out. I think it'll be uglier than uh, a lot of people think it'll be, just in terms of the way that they'll pull wins out. They kind of struggled to to put the White Sox away, Ryan. I mean, Chicago made some late rallies in, in both those games, and Oakland didn't always look sharp. And this is another team in like Minnesota who – at least recently in our lifetime, does not play well in the postseason. So they're trying to to buck that trend a little bit. And I, I, I hope – well, see, here's the thing, Ryan, is the only scenario I would want Houston to win is if they play the Yankees in the ALCS because that will make for outstanding theater, um, in my opinion. But I, I think Oakland wins in five. I, I For the sake of just – the world not having to see this Astros team keep saying, oh, stay mad at us kind of thing. We just won again. Like Oakland has to go in there and win. But the irony of them playing a postseason series in Dodger Stadium the year after the cheating scandal is all there. All the irony in the world. So it, it, would, it would suck if they lost there, Ryan, in Dodger Stadium without cheating. So the tweet in question that we're alluding to before we move on to the, the national league, Houston tweeted a graphic uh, where Carlos Gray was quoted as saying, people are mad. People don't want to see us here. What are they going to say now? We're a solid team. We want a series on the road in Minnesota. So what are they going to say now? And the caption on it uh, by the Houston Astros Twitter account was stay mad. We'll stay winning. And it got 3.1 thousand retweets, 2,000 quote tweets, 11.8 K likes, and close to 2,000 replies. And if you look at their interactions, and this is the point that Matt said that I made, if you look at the interactions on the rest of their tweets, none of them come close to the interactions that that tweet got. So do I agree with it? Do I agree that they should keep just trying to sweep this cheating thing under the rug and just act like, oh, well, why do people not like us? No, I don't think that's the best way they should have gone about it. I mean, ultimately, it comes back to Manfred not punishing these guys harder. But Well, it wasn't even that, too. Didn't they also have a, a situation with a, a female reporter in a locker room, too? Or There was within... that, that. Yes, that happened there, too. So it's just kind of like a skeevy organization, you know, like not, you know, in some ways, obviously you don't want to, it's just, you know, not, let me phrase this in a way to where if I ever get a job with the Astros one day, which probably won't happen. Um, not great situations have happened in Houston over the past few years. So you would kind of want to portray your organization in a positive light. Right, Ryan. I mean, it's just, not great situations between, you know, the reporter incidents and also the cheating scandal, for sure. It's just not, it was just not a tasteful tweet. I'll say that. What's the smile for? Ah, the, my, my good pals, the recycling truck is back. So I'm sorry if you hear that. You probably looped around. Uh, but it's just fun. You, like, if th- stuff like that happened, like, you know, thankfully, social media wasn't around when the Patriots got caught up um, in um, Spygate. But I would have wanted the Patriots to not do this, right? So, coming from someone who's had to endure stuff like this and deflate gate, the Patriots never said, stay mad at us. You know, we deflated footballs. You know, stay mad. Like, you know what I mean, Ryan? Like, it's just, I get why, but like, if you're doing all that for like social media recognition, like, I. I don't think that's worth it, in my opinion. From a, I agree. Uh, from a PR, from a, I'm trying to think about how I want to phrase this. If if the goal, obviously the goal for social media, you want to get interactions and get out there. 
So from that aspect, I agree. I don't know if this was necessarily the best way to go about it. There's a lot of great social media teams in, in the sports landscape. And I follow a couple of people that are behind those and they just do an incredible job. This was an easy way to get interactions. I don't know if it was the best way. But listen, that yeah. there's two sides to it. I can understand why they did it. Do I agree with it? Like, Not necessarily. How much like, but what is that like? Social media interactions, like obviously that's a big part of sports nowadays. But like, how much revenue is that going to really bring in? To kind of portray, like you, you would want to portray yourself in a better light than that. Uh, we'll see though how it works out with this Oakland series. In terms of the players themselves, themselves, Ryan, I don't really know. Like you brought up Correa saying, oh, you know, what are they going to do now? Like we went on the road and won a playoff series. Like you beat the Minnesota Twins in two games in front of no fans. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like it's who are you trying to prove, you know, that you could hit a baseball without hearing the banging of a trash can. Like it's, it's just annoying. I mean, it's the, the – the post, they, you don't need these guys in the postseason right now. It, they're like strangely cocky for a team that really didn't get punished at all for what happened. So it's, you know, it's on Manfred, it's on a lot of people, but not a good luck for sure. Moving over to the National League, two more uh, interdivision matchups in the divisional series. We'll start at the bottom with Miami and Atlanta. Uh, As I said, I was wrong. I I really thought that the Reds would have put up more of a fight. I didn't know that they would have left their bats in Cincinnati and they just went up there without bats, apparently. But I'll give credit to Atlanta. They, listen, they, they did what they needed to do. And I mean, they, the first game, it could have gone either way. The Braves only needed one run there. The second game, they scored five runs. Obviously, the Braves pitching was a lot better than I thought it would be. I don't know if it was because of the Braves pitching or the Reds' inability to put the bat on the ball. But regardless, they moved on, and they will be playing the Miami Marlins, a team that still has never lost a postseason series in their entire franchise history. They are perfect. They swept the Chicago Cubs. They won game one, five to one, one game two two to nothing and now they have advanced the nlds i'm in on the marlins i have the marlins in five i've bought into this team part of it is so the phillies ownership can see how stupid they were over the past however many years to see how they have now fallen behind the marlins in terms of talent evaluation talent development part of it is because i really like what this team does on the field they're not necessarily that team that just goes for the and listen i i get the whole launch angle, exit velocity, home run, or strikeout. I get that. I get the three true outcomes thing. I'm not as against it as a lot of people are, but I like what this team does because they go against that. Don Mattingly and his team, they play a lot of small ball. They do things kind of a different way because they have to, and it works for them. So I'm all in on the Marlins. I think that they're going to upset the Braves here, and I think that they're going to move on to the NLCS. Yeah, so I I originally really liked Atlanta and then – and you talked me into Cincinnati. That didn't work out well. All right. Uh, uh, I, 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 I almost don't, picked. Don't I don't. I can't. I think I picked Chicago to beat Miami. But you, you talked I me into too. Cincinnati. Um. <clears throat> excuse me. Um. I think. I think Atlanta wins in four. Miami will steal a game. You know, it's, it's kind of strange how the best postseason team in sports right now is the Miami Marlins. Uh, we played the game with a football team earlier, Ryan. I don't think I can name 10 Miami Marlins. I, I really don't think I could do that. Um, it's a good story, but I, I think Atlanta, and you know what? I, I think this will actually be the better series than if Chicago made it. Cause I don't think Chicago knows how to score runs in the postseason. So like at least Miami somewhat did, you know, so I, I think this will be the better series. Hot take alert, but Braves in four. So just as a, it's a reference uh, for those that don't know, in the regular season, Miami went four and six against the Atlanta Braves. They scored 44 runs and let up 68. So they'll, they'll need the pitching 
to be a lot better than it was against this team than it was in the regular season. Of course, if anybody was curious, the, the team in the NL East that the Marlins had the best record against was the Phillies, and they went 7-3 and three against them, just putting that out there. But the other series in the NLDS, the Dodgers and the Padres. And apparently Mike Clevenger will be back for this series, which is huge. That's a big addition to this team. I, I really still don't think it matters. The Padres are a great story. They made the playoffs again, which is good. I think they're going to be good for a long time with all the young talent that they have. But I just think the Dodgers are way better. I think they're just immensely more talented right now. So I'm going to go with the Dodgers in four games. I do think that the Padres are able to get one at some point, but I I just think the Dodgers are too good. Yeah, I agree. I have LA in four. I think the thing for San Diego is – you know, obviously you didn't have one met or Clevenger against St. Louis, but the pitching up until the third game when surprisingly they really put it together with a bullpen day with that shutout. Um, the first two games pitching wise weren't really inspiring and you're going to go up against a, a team offensively that could go up five, nothing after the second inning uh, in LA, obviously having Clevenger back. Uh, I'm not sure if they're going to get one met for, this series or not but I think it's just not their year yet they're a great story but I don't think a lot of these games are going to be close either Ryan uh, I think the bats will come alive for their San Diego's like the junior Yankees so like their bats will come alive they'll score a lot of runs they'll give up a lot of runs but they won't do it as frequently as the Yankees so yeah I, I, LA in four some games might be exciting, but, you know, I think both American League series, Ryan, offer a lot more entertainment value than the National League. And with that being said, the NLCS should be more competitive than the ALCS. So it's going to be a trade off there. So both of our World Series predictions are still up. I think you had the Yankees and the Dodgers. I had the Rays and the Dodgers. So we'll see if they're still alive after the divisional series. Well, one of them is going to be off. This it is will, we're playing. Yeah. yeah, one of them. One of, one of them will be, be off the table. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll we'll see. Uh, it's uh, either way though. This is. How did it feel, by the way? Not to make your blood boil as a Phillies fan, but to see like Sixto Sanchez go out there and look really good against Chicago, and like some of those other guys from Miami. How did that make you feel as a Phillies fan? I'm finding it very hard to support this team as the days go on. Just because I, I don't know, it's, it doesn't seem like the ownership cares, which is upsetting. I, I don't trust them to bring in the right GM. It seems like they might actually keep this interim guy for the entire 2021 season because they don't want to spend any money. Uh, what are you, the Mets? Go on, pay somebody. This, this I, I find, I'm finding it very hard to continue to support this team financially and by watching every game. It. I don't know. I, I might have to find a different team soon. Someone can say that I'm being a fair weather fan. It, it, this team has been a ju- people don't understand this team for their entire existence. I'm not going to get into a long rant, but this team for their entire existence has been a complete joke outside of a, a few years here and there. They're the losers. in the nineties. And then you've had the, some like, I mean, they were good. Like my mom would always talk about like the nineties Phillies, you know, like Darren Dalton, like the, the the year they lost to the Blue Jays, like that was a solid team. But I mean, I agree with you. Um, I want to make at least point. at least you're not an Astros fan, Ryan. At least you're I, not an Astros fan. <laughs> so this team, what? I want to make I, the point, went from 1883, the first year of their existence as the Philadelphia Quakers, to 1914 without making the playoffs. And obviously, it was a lot different back then. It was there wasn't really playoffs. It was either you made the World Series or you didn't. In 1915, they finally made the World Series, but they lost in five games. And then from 1916 to 1949, nothing. 1950, they lost the World Series. They got swept. From 1951 to 1975, nothing. And then they lost the NLCS three straight years. They make the playoffs in 79. They finally won the World Series. They got over the hump in 1980. They made the playoffs a couple more times there. Then from 1984 to 92, didn't make it. 94 to 2006 they didn't make it and now from 2012 to now they haven't made it this team has been a joke their entire existence 
as I said, they're the most losingest franchise in baseball history. They were the first, I think the Are first they professional. Yeah. And I think they were the first professional sports team ever to lose 10,000 games. And that happened in 2000, I think 2007 when they lost to the Cubs. I'm pretty sure that's correct. I'm 99% sure that's how it went. So I now, don't does know. It go, when you say losing is franchise, is that based off of uh, like percentage or is that sheer amount of games played in a loss? It's a sheer amount of games lost. Okay. Steve well, you're also more games than any other franchise, which is unacceptable. No, but you're, you, the fr- they've also been around since like Grover Cleveland was president. But so there's I mean, other teams that have been around that long too, and they haven't lost that many games. Okay. Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, so here, let me pose. Let me let me pose this to you, Ryan. Here's and and the Phillies made recent news um, with some of their front office moves, so that's why we're talking about them. Um, for those saying, "Why are we talking about the Phillies during the uh, postseason show?" Um, would you rather be a Astros fan, Ryan, or a Phillies fan? To have no success, but none of the extra baggage, or have the baggage and the World Series? Astros. Ooh. So the Phillies, for those that are interested, the Phillies have lost 11,000 games in their, in their span, and they've won 9,825. So that's a percentage of 472. So actually, for those that are interested, the Phillies have the fifth worst winning percentage in all of baseball. They are at 0.472. The only team's worse are the Mariners, the Rockies, the Marlins, and the Padres. So there, there's a fun fact. Oh, here's another fun fact for you. The Braves started playing in 1876. They only have 10,659 losses. The Cubs started in 1876. They only have 10,404. And they were the lovable losers, too. Yeah. This team has been a joke forever, even before I was born. But you're the weird thing with... The Phillies, Ryan, is you're in a win now mode with your roster, but your front office seems to be in like, ah, eh, you know, we'll see what happens, kind of thing. And the problem with what they did, so Clintac, he's not gone forever. He's actually still with the team. I don't yeah, know I saw that. Got that. demoted. He's still he's taking a different position. Andy McPhail is still there, and his his last name is is a great personification of the type of guy that he is as an executive as a front office executive because the guy fails everywhere the fact that he's still there is such a big issue they brought in both of them at the same time and listen i'm not going to get this this isn't the story this isn't the big thing but they brought mcphail and clentac in at the same time and but Apparently, they could only demote clentac because they weren't successful well if they weren't successful why is McPhail still there? Why is McPhail one of the people that's going to help try to find the next GM? If they weren't successful. And listen, I, the smart pe- the obviously the smart thing to do, find somebody with the Rays, find somebody with the Yankees, find somebody with the Dodgers, give them a blank check and bring them in to fix your organization. Don't take anybody from the Angels like he took Klintak. Don't take people from the Orioles like he did with McPhail and their current interim GM Ned Rice take people from organizations that have actually been successful and they actually know how to develop talent. We got that's all you have to do. Don't take people from losing organizations. There's a reason those organizations lose. It's because of those guys. Don't bring them over here. But I digress. I'm not happy with the team right now. I'm I become less happy with them as the tight the days go on and more reports come out. I don't think they're going to re-sign Real Muto. It doesn't look very good. I don't think they're going to re-sign Gregorius. I'm not. Oof. I'm not confident for the future. But that's it. Not, that's it. That's. I wish you got the birds though. First I, place the, Eagles. Whatever. Right. So Matt, what pops? You know, that's actually going to be pops my tarts. The Philadelphia Phillies ownership. That's what pops my tarts this week. What what pops your tarts? My pops my tarts to keep it short to move on. Um, would be social media uh, posts from teams that should be trying to portray their team in a positive light. So. Mm-hmm. I, as, as you know, I'm a big PR guy. Uh, I would take PR over social media interactions. So that's what pops my thoughts. We'll keep it short this week. So Matt, our star bench cut this week is morning, <coughs> afternoon, and night. And this is, this is a good one. I like this one. So 
I'll let you go first. What's your SBC? Uh, I'm starting the afternoon. I think okay. that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, afternoon, especially in certain seasons, is the best time of the year. Um, you get that nice little breeze in the fall. Sun starts to kind of peak down a little bit, starts to set. Uh, and then you still have the whole night ahead of you. Um, it also features uh, the best meal of the day, Ryan. You, you got like the Pixar lamp there. What are you trying to do here? Yeah, I guess it is kind of the... So behind the scenes footage here, just something that people, you know, this could be interesting. This is normally a light that I would use to illuminate my face from this direction. But because it's such a beautiful day, as Matt's saying, because it's the afternoon, because there's so much natural light, I didn't have to use this today, which was nice. So I got to save on my electricity bill. All right. So I'm starting the afternoon, has the best meal of the day and lunch, uh, the best time of the day, uh, warmest part of the day as well, for those who prefer warmth. Uh, I'm benching night. Uh, could be uh, so. Afternoon's great because it, it builds anticipation to your favorite uh, sporting events. Uh, so you have that build there and then that leads into nighttime, which will be great, right? And then you're busy all night watching sports, doing stuff. You eat the second best meal of the day and dinner. Um, so night is number two. Uh, and then I'm, I'm cutting uh, mornings. Mornings suck. You and I did it uh, for a long time, waking up at like 6 a.m. to go to a morning show. Uh, and then the past year, I'd wake up at like 5 a.m. to go to work. Uh, wasn't great um, just in terms of waking up and it's still being dark and then leaving work and it was dark again. So I never see daylight. Daylight's great, Ryan. So I'm, I'm, I don't like mornings though. People who wake up to watch the sunrise, I think are weird. Why would you want to wake up at 4 a.m. to go watch something, you know, rise from the ocean? You know, like it's not a thing for me. Don't do that to yourself. Cut the morning. Mornings suck. Uh, um, I guess that, I guess when we become like full, like, 30 year old adults, Ryan, I think, I guess that's when we start liking mornings and saying, Oh, I'm a morning person to like the people on Facebook that say, I love mornings. I wake up at 7 AM to make breakfast and watch good morning America. Like those people are psychos wake up at 10 AM or start your day that way. Especially, you know, because I've been working nights the past summer. That's why I wake up at 10 AM. Don't think I'm like, you know, I, but sleeping in and waking up and the morning's already gone. Great feeling. So cut in the morning. I was going to, so I'm also going to start the afternoon um, for the reasons you said. I was going to say I can envision a time in my life. I don't know when it will be where I wake up at a nice early, a nice early time. Sun's coming up. You hear the birds chirping, maybe go out on in your backyard, on your deck, on your patio, sit down just kind of be with yourself, just kind of have a nice calm way of waking up. I can envision myself liking that at some point in the future. That's not what I like right now. I, I Listen, in my mind, I would like to wake up earlier than I do and start my day earlier and be up in the morning and do stuff in the morning and feel productive. In my mind, that seems like a good thing to do. I can't do that right now. It's just that I think, as you alluded to, we did it for an entire year, waking up at 6 in the morning to do a 7 a.m. radio show. I think I, I still need a break from that three years later. So I have the same list as you. I know that's not great listening fodder for all those out there to have the same exact well, here, pitch I'll, cut, but... I'll give something for people to listen to. Let me paint this scenario for you, right? Your alarm goes off, 5 a.m., right? It's... January 18th or like January 27th. We'll go January 27th. So a little bit later on in winter, right? January 27th. It's a weekday. You get up. You had a long day of watching football yesterday. It's a Monday morning. Then on top of that, you go down, you make your breakfast, you're getting ready for work. Then you go outside. It's 27 degrees out, Ryan. Because it's the morning and the sun isn't up yet to melt your ice off your car. So now you got to go scrape. You got to start shipping at your car. You got to scrape it off. You're, you're getting frostbite and everything else. 
then you get in the car, but the car still has to warm up. Then you got to drive to work. By that time, after all that work you did, you finally get to actual work. It's like 9 a.m. And then you're still cold, so you got to warm yourself up. And then by five o'clock and you get home, you just want to like go to bed. So mornings are bad. Um, I will say though, there's a big difference between 5 a.m. and like 9 a.m., right? So if you wake up at like 7.30 or like eight o'clock to start work at nine, that's not so bad. But like when you got to wake up at like 5 a.m., if you have like an earlier shift, you got to be there by like seven or something, not good. So there's a picture I paint. I will say there there's certain months and you kind of alluded to it as well. It's not fun to wake up early in the morning in January. I'd say from like September to maybe the first couple of weeks of November, it's kind of nice. I'd yeah. say from late April to mid June, it's nice to wake up in the morning and maybe you can make a case a little before and after, but the other times of the year, it's not fun to wake up that early. And as, as me and Matt have both alluded to, we would know because we did wake up early in those months. And let me tell you, it was having to, I will say it was a little different because it's not like we lived in, in Maine. We did live in New Jersey. So yeah, but we also like, lived, we also lived on the beach though. We did. So like those that, coastal winds, when you yeah. get out of your apartment, like we did in the morning would hit you like a brick. And that was, you know, it did wake Back you up. The- I will say this. It did wake you up. You, you get out there, you just feel the 20 mile per hour wind just slam you right in the face. That did wake you up. And that was also two or three years ago, Ryan, uh, to where our earth was a little bit colder uh, because as some people might not know, it's getting warmer every year. Um, so last winter was a little bit balmy compared to what we experienced junior year. Again, not, not saying anything, um, but so a little colder then too. So it woke us up for sure. Um, but winter now, it's like you go out and it's like 40 degrees. Pretty sure when I would wake up to go to work, um, it like, and I didn't mind it. Like once you get to work, it's okay. But like the whole process of like waking up early, I guess that's like an adult thing that we have to like get used to eventually, Ryan, uh, because in college we could take classes later in the day. Um, so I guess that's the adjustment period. But like, I see people on Facebook, Ryan, and, and people our age, they're like, oh man, like. I woke up at 6 a.m. and I'm watching the sunrise. I'm like, you're, like, you're crazy. Sleep. If you have the ability to sleep in and work later in the day, do it. So that's what I got to say about that. So that was Best Available Podcast, episode number nine. We'll be back next week. We'll have some more football. We'll have baseball discussion. Who the hell knows? Maybe we'll get that guest that we've been talking about for a month. We'll We'll wait and see. It'll be a surprise to us, too, when he finally says yes. But uh, I want to thank you all for listening. And we'll catch you guys again next time.